Hi, it's Sam. In this video, we will be going through the hypothesis testing, the t-test, mean-test, z-score of a standard normal distribution um, under the interactive uh, uh, R workshop of statistical inference. So let's open the R studio. Hypothesis testing. So this is a pretty dry and uh, deep session. So in this lesson, uh, as the name suggests, the hypothesis testing, okay, making decisions about the population using the observed sample data. So we infer the population by what we know. It's kind of a predictive predictions. <clears throat> An important concept in hypothesis testing is to call the noun hypothesis. So it's usually denoted as H0. H0 is a noun hypothesis. It's a hypothesis represented called the status quo and is assumed to be true. Status quo that means no change, everything is still the same. So yesterday uh, I, eat I eat chicken rice, and today status quo I eat chicken rice again. If nothing changes, then tomorrow I will eat chicken rice again. So this is called a uh, noun hypothesis. Nothing new, nothing changed, nothing exciting. So every day is a, a good old day. So, uh, it is a baseline against which you are testing the alternative hypothesis. Usually we denote it with H A and H alternative. Statistical evidence is required to reject H0 in favor of the research of alternative hypothesis. See, for example, last five weeks, I have been eating chicken rice. And uh, if nothing changed, I will continue to eat chicken rice. But uh, today, I started to learn that all the chickens has gone, or all the chickens get uh, disappeared in, in, the, in Singapore, where I live now. Then tomorrow, what will I eat? It's very unlikely tomorrow I will be able to eat chicken rice because there's no chicken. So things have changed. So we have to accept the alternatives. Uh, that is about uh, now hypothesis, eat chicken rice continuously. And we find some evidence saying that there's no chicken anymore. So that is the time that I have to reject my now hypothesis. I cannot eat chicken rice anymore then I have to accept an alternative. So tomorrow the alternative is not eating chicken rice, but when I eat duck rice or ban mian or uh, some other dishes, I don't know, anyway, it's not eating a uh, chicken rice. So we reject high chicken rice hypothesis and accept the alternative. So that's it. Okay, so we consider a motivating example from the blah 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 uh, okay disturbance index of the 30 events per hour is considered evident for a sleep disordered breathing so suppose that a sample of 100 overnight subjects overweight subjects with other risk factors at a sleep clinic and the mean was 32 events per hour with a standard deviation of 10 events per hour Okay, so this is the background. So there will be 100 overweighted people being surveyed. Okay, so they measure their events per hour. So this event is called a respiratory disturbance index. Uh, they measure some kind of uh, sleep disorder events. So they measure these 100 people and uh, they calculate for this. 100 people, the average RDI, the events per hour, is 32. But since each people, their events number is different, so they have a variance, which is indicated by the standard deviation of 10 events per hour. Okay, now we have a benchmark of 30 events per hour, which is a uh, benchmark. So if it's more than 30, we say, okay, it seems that overweight is people are more likely to have this disorder. If it's less than that, then it's not very obvious. So let's see how we test this in the context of uh, hypothesis testing. 
So we form the null hypothesis first. The null hypothesis is the average is 30, 30 events per hour. So the alternative hypothesis is the actual average as RDI index is more than 30. Okay, the mu represent hypothesis as the population mean. Nah, population mean. Because we only know these 100 overweighted uh, people, we do not know whether this applies to the entire universe. Okay, so we have to estimate. <clears throat> so we have two competing hypotheses, H0 and H8. We'll pick one. Four possible outcome determine what really is the truth. So the hypothesis we accept based on our data, two of the outcome are correct and two are errors. Okay, it's still a lot theory before we go to the calculation. So which of the following outcome would be correct? <coughs> so it's a bit tricky. H0 is true and we reject it. HA is true, we accept it. HA is false, we accept it. H0 is false, we accept it. So you might be confused by this H0, HA, blah, blah, blah. The key thing here is if something is true, we have to accept. If something is false, we reject. Right? No matter it's H0 or HA. We only care about the truth. So what, what will be correct is something true, we accept it. Something true we reject definitely is not right. Something false we accept it is also not right. So it will be number two, right? If something is true, we accept it. So which of the following will be an error? So same thing, eh? something true we reject it. That's not right. Eh? False reject right. True accept right. Then false reject. And you can do a lot of combination. It doesn't really matter whether it's H0 or H8. The H0, H8 here is uh, simply to confuse you. Uh, okay, so which one is the error? The first one. True, we reject. That's all right. Okay, it's correct to accept a true hypothesis or reject a false one. Pretty clear, right? So we only accept truth and reject false one. The error is also clear. Rejecting a true hypothesis or accepting a false one. Now, nah, that's a risk. Nah. So we distinguish these two errors. So type 1 error is called rejects a true non-hypothesis, H0, and the type 2 error is accepting a false non-hypothesis called H0. Okay, so it's, it doesn't have an uh, example. So I give you an example here. Say in the court, there are someone being captured saying an innocent person is a real innocent person, which is a true non-hypothesis. Non-hypothesis is some person is always innocent unless it's proved to be guilty. Right? So someone like Sam is, I'm an innocent people and I'm a truly innocent people. So I'm a true non-hypothesis. If someone, the court says, hey Sam, the verdict, the trial said, hey, I have to convict you, then it is actually called reject a true non hypothesis. I'm innocent, but I get to the jail. So this is called type 1 error. This is a type 1 error. Okay, so send some good person to jail, which is rejecting a true non hypothesis, which is an error. Then type 2 error is accept a false non-hypothesis. So now this time assume Sam, I'm a criminal, I'm a long-time criminal. And uh, I pretend to be an innocent during the court. I defend myself, blah, 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 and put all these evidence. I was not there, I didn't commit this uh, crime. Then, but indeed I'm a criminal, I did that bad thing. So, however, the jury and the uh, judge who were persuaded by my defense so they say okay then let's release them so now a guilty truly guilty people uh, is uh, is not being sent to jail so i'm a false innocent people i'm a guilty people guilty people is a false innocent people and uh, 
we accept that so that you commit a type 2 error so you send these guilty people free huh? you set that free so and you assume I'm a innocent people you assume I'm a null hypothesis but actually I'm not a null hypothesis I'm a false one so you accept that one then I escape that's a type 2 error if you put into the context of the span span email <clears throat> so for a majority of the email they are non spam so they are considered as a non hypothesis not a spam email so a not a spam email being rejected so it being considered as a spam email so this is a type 1 error so false positive false positive so in uh, email good email is uh, flagged as a spam so this is a false positive and the type 2 is a false negative for that spam email who escaped the anti-spam mechanism and landed into your inbox so this is type 2 error not false negative right it should be goes to the uh, go to the spam folder but it didn't go to the spam folder it landed into your your mailbox inbox so that's a false negative not false negative so escape <clears throat> okay I will be sure we're absolutely right no we are not always sure absolutely right no. because everything is about the probability it's about probability although we say something has a low chance but it doesn't mean it's no chance for example, by for the total, we have a very low chance to win a big lottery, but there are still chance someone will actually win. Will win. Okay. Okay, we deal with the probability hypothesis test instead of probably making error small. But we'll focus on the type one error, rejecting a correct hypothesis. <coughs> It's a probability of making type 1 error, which is false positive. Rejecting a true hypothesis, you increase the probability of the type 2 error. So, in the later sessions, there will be, uh, we will be going through different types of errors and uh, how these two are traded off in the confusion matrix. Okay. Oh, here is it. So the null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent. If the innocent man committed what type of error it is, we know that this is type 1 error, rejecting a true hypothesis. You might send an innocent man to jail by rejecting. Suppose a guilty person is not convicted. What type of is this? This is 2, right? Okay, back to sleep. Back to sleep example. <laughs> A reasonable step here would reject the null hypothesis if our sample mean x was larger than some constant c, which is 30 events per hour. Um, the null hypothesis reject the probability. So see the probability of a type 1 error alpha is 0 0.05. Okay, 0.05% chance. Many scientific papers use 0.055% as level of rejection <clears throat> okay recall the standard error of sample means given by the formula as uh, standard error divided by square root of n n is number of samples recall this in our example we have a sample of 100 subjects our mean value is 32 with a standard deviation of 10. So what is an error of the mean in this example? This is 10 divided by SQRT and n equals to 100. Okay, so this is 1. Under hypothesis theorem is normally distributed with mean value m equal to 30 variance equal to 1. We are estimating the variance at the square of the standard error, which in this case is 1. 
Okay, we are estimating the variance as the square of the standard error. In this case, is one. Okay, standard error. So the mean population's variance is the variance is the same as the square. Not the variance; it should be the standard deviation. But in this case, this, the standard deviation is equal to one. So one square is its variance is still one. So the square root of the sample standard error. Okay. So this is why we have this assumption here. We want to choose the constant c so that the probability x is greater than c given h0 is 0 0.05. So px greater than c is 5%. Sound familiar? So c value is 30 and x is 32. Okay, have a look. <clears throat> this is the probability density function. This is plot to show what we mean. The shaded portion here represents 5% of the area under the curve, this pink color. And those x value in it are those of which the probability x greater than c is 5%. <clears throat> so put in a simple term, the total area under this curve, probability density function, is 1, so 100%. So we have to cut somewhere to leave to split the area into two. The left hand side will be 95% and the right hand side will be 5%. And this is the place. Ah, this is the place. 5%. So this is around 1.64. Because this is a standard uh, normal distribution. So 5% here is actually will translate to 1.64. Sigma. Okay, <clears throat> so the shaded portion, 5% of the area, blah blah blah, which expression represents the smallest value for which the area is shaded, assuming this is standard normal. This is uh, Q0, yeah, 3, 3, quantile, so you get the quantile value. So 95th percentile of a standard normal is 1.64. That this value is around 1.645. Yeah, 1.645. Standard deviation from the mean. So in our sample, we have to set the C to be 1.645 standard deviation more than our hypothesis mean of 30. That is C equals to 30 plus 1.64 times 1, not standard error, equal to 31.645. Okay, so <clears throat> this means if our 100 overweighted people's average RDI index is more than this value, 31.645. We are pretty sure this is a rare event. It only appears less than 5% because that value is greater than that. So it sits into this shaded area. So this shaded area is 5% chance to happen naturally. Okay, so that means it's a rare event. Let's continue. So the mean that if we observe x greater than c, then it's only 5% chance that a random draw from this normal distribution is larger than c. So <clears throat> this curve is plotted based on, uh, this is standard c value, and this is standard normal distribution. So this is area of 5%. Okay, so recall that our observed x is 32. This is actually the real measurement of the 100 overweighted people, which is actually greater than 31.645. So it falls in the five area region. So what shall we do? It falls into this region. <clears throat> 
This graph tells us here is a threshold. Although this is a standard norm, the uh, this score, but this score can is recalculate or transformed into this constant by using the above formula. So this is the place that is 31.645 and the 32 is to the right of this cutoff line. So this 32 is a small chance event and we observe in our sample. So that means this situation is unlikely to happen. But if our sample's mean value is 630, which is smaller than 31, so it fits in these larger 95% areas, that means that 30, less than 31 to 30 average number is actually uh, expected. Yeah, it's more frequently to be expected to happen in this area. So in, if it's this case, then we will accept the uh, H0, the null hypothesis. If the sample's mean value sits into this area, but in our situation, the 32 is the real mean value we get. So it sits into these unlikely to happen areas. So if something is very unlikely to happen, if the null hypothesis is unlikely to happen, what shall we do with it? We should reject it, right? So I would say we will reject it if it's unlikely to happen. So the rule here is reject hypothesis, zero null hypothesis, when the sample mean greater than that has the property that the probability of rejecting when it is true is 5% given the model of this sample. Hypothesis mean equal to 30, variance 1, and the number of sample is 100 over weighted person. Okay, so this is also a uh, one-sided t-test as well. <coughs> Instead of computing a constant c as a cut point for accepting blah blah blah, we can simply compute a z score, a number of standard deviation from the hypothesis mean blah blah. So this is a reverse way of doing it. <coughs> so this is a reverse way of doing it to calculate the z score. So earlier we trans uh, we used this 1.64 standard deviation to calculate the constant c value which is around 31.6 then we are doing the reverse way we shift and transform the samples distribution back to calculate its uh, corresponding z score in this z distribution and find out whether the z score is to the left of the cutoff line or to the left of the cutoff line so this is what it's doing now Okay, so the standard, okay. This is two, okay. The standard arrow is this value, that right? is one. So the Z score for this example required is 32 minus 30 divided by the standard arrow, which is equal to one. So two divided by one equals to two. We didn't get to the Z score is 2, the quantile is 1.64. So since 2 greater than 1.645, what shall we do? Okay. So it's reverse calculation. Use 32, which is the actual mean value we get from the sample, minus the hypothetical threshold of the RDA index, which is 30 events per hour. So 32 minus 30, which equals to two, divided by the standard error. The standard error is calculated by this, from the sample mean and the sample uh, variance. These are two things that we already know. So finally, we get the Z score for the sample is two, uh, two. And the two in this standard normal distribution, two is here. 1.64 95 percentile 
95 confidence is here. So 2 is to the right of is inside this shaded area. So it's considered as a unlikely to have an effect. So two ways we are doing the same thing. So since 2 is in this area, shaded area, so we have to reject the null hypothesis. What if if we get a z score is around 1? 1 is lower than 1.645, then we will say, okay, 1 is inside this null hypothesis. Confident 95% times we are confident. So we won't reject, we will accept. But it's actually in this area, so we cannot accept, we reject. So reject, <coughs> reject null hypothesis. Okay, so the general rule of for rejection is this uh, square root. Okay, the alpha is 0 0.0545 for 95%, 0 0.01 for 99% confidence. Okay, which our test statistic is x minus population mean divided by the standard error. And this is also called a z score. Z -score. So the mean and our test are the mean and the standard deviation. Zero mean unit variance. Zero mean one standard deviation. So zero and one. Zero and one. Zero one. It's a standard norm. It's also called a uh, a zero mean a unit variance. Unit variance means mean one variance. Okay. So we are forty percent done. Let's review and expand. Our now hypothesis is that the population mean equals to the value value mean and with the alpha 0 0.05. This is the probability that we check if it's true. We can have several different alternative hypotheses. Okay. Our first hypothesis is mu smaller than mu zero. We would reject mu and accept alternative. When we observe sample mean is slightly lesser than that, test or is lesser than the observer. This is more than to the left. This is more than that to the left of the mean. Okay. So this is another tale. <clears throat> because we have changed the uh, null hypothesis. The earlier null hypothesis is greater than that, and currently the null hypothesis becomes smaller than that, so the two areas uh, sweep, switch to the place. Uh, the shaded portion is 5% area under the curve. Those values are at least standard deviation less than the mean. Hmm? The probability of this area is fine. This means that if our sample fell in this area, we would reject a true null hypothesis, which is uh, mu equal to mu zero with probability five. Okay, we already covered the alternative hypothesis, which is mu greater than mu zero, but let's review it. We reject zero and accept when our sample mean is what? Huh? Okay, it should be either significantly greater than mu zero or significantly lesser than that. <clears throat> what should be the one? Should reject and accept. Our HA is that mu greater than that. We should accept when significantly greater than mu zero. Right? This means our test statistic is what? One point six four is standard deviation greater than mu zero at least 1.64 deviation less than zero
our test statistics should be let's have a look let's have a look so this is a plot showing this okay the shaded portion represent 5% of area curve and those x values in it are those which are at least 1.64 standard deviation greater than the mean the probability of this is 5% mean that if our observed mean fell in this area we would reject a true null hypothesis that will equal to mean with probability 5% so this is the area they are not equal Okay, finally, let's consider alternate hypothesis HA that mu is simply not equal to hypothesis, uh, the mean hypothesis by the now hypothesis is H0. We'll reject H0 and accept when our sample mean is significantly different from that is either less or greater than mu0. Okay, so this is two tailed test. So, since we want to stick with a 5% rejection rate, we divide it in half and consider values at both tails. Okay, either greater or smaller than that. <clears throat> so, this is a plot that you will see. So, the mean value is centered at here, the score equal to zero. Say, so we will say that the high. Uh, now hypothesis is the mean, the difference is zero. And uh, if it's largely different from the hypothesis, then they'll fail into the two sides, two sides, the not equal right? hypothesis. Zero is equal, hypothesis, alternate hypothesis is not equal. Not equal can be either great than that or a lot smaller than that. So there's two sides. So these two shaded area add up together should be 5%, 5%. So on one side it's 0 0.25. So it's actually near 2. Okay, so this is called 1.96. This is a 1.96 area. <clears throat> so this time though it's comprised composes of two equal pieces each containing 2.5% of the probability under the curve. The x value in the shaded portion of the value that is 1.696 standard deviation of it from the system. Mean. Okay, type 1 arrow. <coughs> it says if we something indeed happens here. Later we find another the, the 101 patient this seems to have a very high uh, RDF, the I index value so 34, 35 events uh, per hour and that person is a genuine uh, sample and we may have committed a core type 1 error so we rejected the true uh, overweighted person so that one we say we have five percent chance of making mistakes since our tests are based on alpha the probability of type 1 error we say that we fail to reject rather than accept we fail to reject then blah 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 so we not have enough data to reject it okay okay type 2 error we are discuss at the moment there is a term for power or call false negative false negative rate determine the appropriate sample size in experiment so in general with more samples the more confident we are we, we do more surveys than our conclusions or our test statistics or our conclusion based on our test uh, will be more accurate so this is rule of thumb and it's quite intuitive so this paragraph says if 
we try to avoid errors no matter type 1 or type 2 but if we have a larger and a larger sample size we are more likely to avoid both errors we call the region of value for these two reject we call the region of the, the rejection region yeah, is it yeah that's very straightforward right? that if someone some value fails into the rejection region then we reject normal and implicit rely on the central limit theorem okay so far we talk about normal distribution okay Be, has to be large. Right? So central limit theorem requires that sample size to be large. Right? So the larger the better, and the rule of thumb is at least greater than 30. Right? It's greater than 30. Okay, we don't have a larger sample, we can use a T distribution. So sometimes we do not have a large sample size. <clears throat> then in this case, we instead of using normal distribution, we use it or t distribution so here we go to the t distribution t distribution is a little bit more conservative uh, to give uh, conclusion and estimations compared with normal distribution when the sample size is small especially smaller than 30 so t distribution are more conservative uh, it will give a uh, more realistic estimate while normal distribution will give uh, over optimized uh, uh, optimized uh, optimistic uh, uh, estimates when the sample size is small so we don't use normal distribution when the sample size is small except instead of normal quantum we use the t quantum and use an n minus one degree of freedom very handy t distribution Okay, let's go back to our sleep example. And suppose our sample size is 16 instead of 100, as before. Then the sample mean, standard deviation 10, says the true mean is 30 for the this. And the alternative is true mean greater than 30. With this smaller sample size, we compute the same way. Okay, namely this. Okay, what is the value of this sample size of 16? 32 minus 30 standard deviation 10 divided by SQRT, which is 4. Okay, 0 0.8. So the standard error is 0 0.8. How many degree of freedom do we have for the sample size 16? So 16 minus 1, 10 minus 1. Under H0, the probability that the test statistic is larger than 95%. Yeah, this is the T distribution. So we can have a look at the T distribution by using question mark on tau T. So it pulls out the help page so we have the density function probability quantile and the random t so the t distribution is called standard t distribution which is a uh, more conservative uh, distribution compared with uh, normal distribution when the sample size is small so move on to c okay QT 0.95 giving degree of freedom 15 we get 1.75 1.75 if you recall is greater than 1.645 normal distribution when normal distribution have 95% confidence right so it's wider wider means wider confidence interval which means it's more conservative so the test statistics we computed earlier is 0.8 when we have 16 overweighted sample. So it's lesser than 1.75. It's lesser than 1.75. That means 
this T fell in the majority of this 95% chance that we will expect to observe the 32 appears right so that means from the statistical inference context 32 is very similar to the mean value 30 okay so they are considered the same okay so what does this mean it means we fail to reject hypothesis zero we fail to reject so 32 and 30 are very similar so now let's consider a two-sided test, two-sided t-test. Okay, so we have to split the 5% into two parts. So now we use quantile 0 0.975, okay, lower and the higher. Okay. This is right side, this is the left side. So do you expect to be bigger or smaller than Quantile 0 0.95, it should be bigger. It should be bigger. So here is 0 0.95 with the t value of uh, 1.7, and this is 5%. 5%. And 2.5% is to the right of it, so that value will be larger than 1.75. So it's larger than that. Okay. Since the test statistic 0.8 is smaller than quantile 0.9, which is 1.7, this 1.7 is smaller than the quantile 0.975. So we can say the 0.8 test score, test statistic is lesser than the quantile 0.975. So it's smaller. smaller. Then what about the left tail? Left tail, left tail quantile 0 0.025. It actually should be a negative value. It will be that 0 is in the middle, so the left tail will be in the negative value. So it will be lesser than 0. So 3 is lesser than 0. So the bottom line here, there is how the important conclusion here is if you fail to reject the one-sided test, you have tried a one-sided test, with 5% confidence, uh, you know that you will fail to reject two-sided, okay? Because it's even wider. The confidence interval is even wider. So that's a takeaway. So, so the t-test, 0.5, uh, failed both tests. What should we do? We reject the non-hypothesis. Oh, sorry, we accept the non-hypothesis. Or we say we failed to reject. Fail to reject is number one. Okay, <clears throat> so normally we don't need to do these uh, nitty-gritty calculations step-by-step, step, calculate the score, uh, transform either the uh, from the samples domain to the z-domain or from the z-domain to the samples domain. So normally we don't do that. We have a t-test. Uh, we have a t-test. We'll happily do the work. So how do we use it? Let's see. Okay, so to illustrate the t-test, we have a data set. Compare the data of uh, father and the sons, whether they have similar heights or non-similar heights. That is a data set of measuring a few fathers' height and their sons' height. And uh, we do a t-test. And our nine hypothesis is father's height does not impact some sum's height. They are similar. Look at the dimension of fs using our function dimension. Father and the son. Father and the son. So we have 1075 fathers and 107, uh, 1078 fathers and 1078 sons measurements. Okay. Two high plus pad equal to true. T test. Can I have a look at T test. What should you supply? X. X. 
two-sided alternative is two-sided less or greater. The mu value by default is zero, paired equal to force equal variance. Variance equal equal to force is our default value. Confidence interval is 0.95. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Test. A father, son, uh, contain height of father and son of brothers, blah blah blah. Taking one of the two ways. First, we run it with just one argument. Difference between the heights, say. Okay. This is uh, son's height minus father's height. And this is pair test, so we set the paired argument equal to true. Let's analyze the result. Okay, just fathers. Height minus sum's height. So this is not a plan, just one sample t test. So we test the difference. So the t statistics is uh, this value 11, uh, 11, 11. So the t statistics is 11, which is quite large. So we reject the now hypothesis that the true mean of the difference was zero right so we reject it so the father's height and the son's height are not equal to zero so they are different then the true difference in means was zero so we ran the test on the two separate but paired columns okay of acid and standard error between the sample and the hypothesis to me. This is the meaning of the t-test, t-statistics. You can test this by multiplying blah 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 by the standard deviation. Okay, this is theory. Okay, you can get the mean value. Yeah, get the mean value. Give it a close match to the mean value at x give you. It's mean value. 95% confidence interval, 0.08, do we return by the t-test? Yes, zero, it does not fail into it, so uh, the difference is significantly higher than the mean value, which is zero difference, the null hypothesis. We assume no difference between father and son, so their difference is expected to be zero. But we find out from the samples data that uh, their true difference is significantly different from zero because zero does not fail into it. Okay. Yeah. We have gone very far till now. So there is strong similarity between the confidence interval and the hypothesis test. So basically they are the same. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, now we move to a different distribution called binomial distribution. Uh, so it's a discrete distribution. By considering the sample from the sides, a family has eight children seven of whom are girls and none are twins pretty a lot girls let the null hypothesis be either gender is equally likely yeah it's like a coin flip so normally you have eight kids uh, generally there will be probably four girls four boys and now since we have seven girls and one boy, uh, is this considered as a uh, rare event or not? 
let's set the alpha 0 0.05 probably there are so different rejections so I it's a high scale out of a hotspot eight. They have defined a nine long vector maybe which shows nine probability for the eyes of which probability are at least one minus go out of eight possible okay so this is the probability so this says my being equal to means that the probability one there's at least zero goals at least the zero goals we have hundred percent at least there might be two is so point out this is a probability that we have at least one girl out of eight at least one girl so it's 99.6 percent chance that we have at least one girl and so forth this probability is calculated from a core a binomial distribution a binomial distribution binomial distribution so that one is from binomial distribution And hat becoming specific package it might not have been loaded. Okay, so let's continue. Let's park it first. So, what is at least the value of i for which the probability is lesser than 0.0? .0? Right, it's this one. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we should put the eight first. Let's move on first. My being eight is a probability of having at least seven girls. So the chance of having at least seven girls is around three percent. All this percentage is from a different distribution called binomial distribution. So these are fixed number. So filling this region of so this is less than 0 0.05 of sample force in the region of rejection. Does that mean we accept or reject the non hypothesis? So the gender is equally likely. So the thing here is <clears throat> having a seven girls out of eight kids, the chance is uh, 0.03 yeah this is uh, deterministic or in the ideal probability uh, world with uh, gender equality it will be three percent so three percent is lesser than five percent of predefined confidence so it's pretty rare only three percent of chance you will get seven girls out of eight so in this case, we will reject that the gender equality in that particular family. So we reject. So finally, we know that a two-sided test would mean that our alternative hypothesis is that P is not equal to 0 0.05. And it's not obvious how to do this with binomial distribution. So don't worry that much that in the next few lessons when we're talking about p-values in depth that will make it clearer so yeah it's interesting for that discrete distribution such as binomial and the poison inverting two-sided test is how uh, okay i calculate the exact test that is go to the deep, uh, depths of these r things okay it does not rely on central limit theorem because central limit theorem is built based on normal distribution Okay, so yeah, this is a heavy lesson and also it's pretty long and dry. Uh, spend some time to digest it. Okay, so congratulations, you finished this course and uh, we will move on to the next ones in the next session. Yeah, thanks for joining. See you later.